guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here with Henry. Hello. And today is our next installment of our Declaration of Independence Cider series, and we're taking a look at the guy behind us. Who is it, Henry? John Penn. That's right, John Penn, our third and final signer from the state of... North Carolina. That's right, North Carolina. This is it. Our last signer from North Carolina, and then we move on to our next state. Pretty incredible, we're rolling right through here, right? So, before we get into John Penn, our third and final signer from the state of North Carolina, Henry, tell the people what they need to do. Hit subscribe down below, leave like, comment, question, and the thumbs up, and hit the <laughs> He's got it, playing with his Christmas Santa hat. Hit subscribe down below, give us a like and a thumbs up. Uh, comments, questions, right? We love those, keep all those coming, please. And then, of course, hit the little notification bell so you can be notified when we do release a new video. And Henry, tell the people when that is. Every single week. Every single week. So, here we go. Next Declaration of Independence Signer Series in the public double double, right? I know I'm stuttering over myself. We're taking a look at John Penn. And this is Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you, here with Henry, and the guy behind us, John Penn, our last signer from the state of North Carolina. Now, interestingly enough, Henry said, when you hit that notification bell, you know, it notifies you because we release new videos every single week. But after this week, we're actually... We're going to take two weeks off because of Christmas. That's right, he's absolutely right. We're going to take a two-week break because of the Christmas holiday, and then we're going to return again in the new year. So, it is usually every single week, except for a little Christmas break. Yes. But, let's talk about John Penn, right? John Penn, he actually was a self-taught man. He taught himself how to read, how to write. I believe he even taught himself law. I mean, he was a pretty... He came from very, very humble beginnings, and he had to teach himself everything as far as education went. So, pretty cool stuff. And John Penn, his original gravesite is one of the coolest gravesites I ever visited. It's in the middle of the woods, literally, yes. It's very, very kind of eerie, and I'm going to tell you all about that when uh, we get to that part, of course, but it's pretty cool. Well, let's see. They did the likes, they did the subscribes, comments, questions. Hopefully, they're doing all those things so Santa doesn't put coal in their stocking, right? Hopefully, they're being good boys and girls, right? <laughs> they're on the good list and not the naughty list. Mm -hmm. So they did all that stuff. Now, Henry, what do they got to go get? They got the potato chips, the pretzels, the... What else? Soda. Soda? But, I mean, it's Christmas yeah. time. Christmas cookies. Christmas cookies, the candy canes, whatever you like, right? Yes. The Christmas holiday snacks. Go get them. Gummy bears. Gummy bears. There you go. Go get all of it. Go get your snacks because here we go. Our last North Carolina signer of our Declaration of Independence Signer Series, John Penn. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. and enjoy. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next installment of our Declaration of Independence Signer Series as we take a look at John Penn, our third and final signer from the state of North Carolina. Hard to believe we're already going to be through and done with yet another state. So Georgia's done, and as of uh, this week, we will be done with North Carolina as we look, of course, at John Penn to uh, finish out the state. Uh, I am here with a very special guest. Hello, Henry. Hello. How are you? Good. Good. So, and me and Henry... We want to wish everybody out there a very hey, Merry, Merry Christmas, right? Merry yeah. Christmas. Mm -hmm. Merry Christmas to everyone and a Happy New Year. That's right. right. A very healthy, happy New Year to everyone out there. Uh, because as Henry alluded to in the, uh, in the introduction, 
Uh, this week, we're doing John Penn to close out North Carolina. And then we're going to take a two-week break for Christmas. We're going to enjoy the holiday and enjoy some time with uh, family and friends. And then we'll be back because our next, actually, our next date is, any guess, Henry? Um, give me a hint. Well, we just did North Carolina. South Carolina. Very good. South Carolina is our next date. So, just so everyone knows, we release videos Wednesdays and Thursdays. So, we will be back on Wednesday, January 4th of 2023. Hard to believe, right, Henry? Yeah. Hard to believe. So, one other thing. I mean, Henry, not only are we spending time with friends and family for the uh, holidays, Henry and I, only a week from now, are going to visit where, Henry? That's right, the White House. Henry and I have been selected. Uh, we've been approved, and our background, of course, is all good to go. And we have been selected to come and visit and tour the White House. We've been invited uh, by President Biden and Dr. Jill Biden, First Lady. Uh, so myself, Henry, uh, Kurt Dion of KurtzHistoricSites.com, and his dad, the four of us, are going to go tour the White House, right, Henry? Yes. How cool is that going to be? Very cool. <laughs> yeah, very cool. So it's something that not many people get to do. Uh, and it's, I'll be honest, I was telling Henry, I don't know anyone that's ever done it. No one. How about you, Henry? No. Yeah, I don't know anyone that's ever done it. So Henry and I will be the first that we know of to be uh, actually inside the White House. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and as far as pictures go, we'll have to see. I know they're pretty strict about pictures when you tour the White House. Some Secret Service allow you to take pictures inside, and other Secret Service do not allow you. So we'll have to see, right? Yeah. We'll have to see if we get lucky enough to take some photos and share with you guys. So there you go. A very Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas from us to you. Happy New Year. And, uh, let, hey, what do you think, Henry? Should we just jump right in and start talking about John Penn? Yes. Let's do it. Let's jump right in, talk about John Penn, our third and final signer from the state of North Carolina. Henry, thanks for stopping in. You're welcome. And we will see you in the new year. Sound good? Yes. All right. Bye-bye now, Henry. Bye-bye. The Declaration of Independence did not hit the world like an unheralded thunderbolt. It was preceded by small-scale declarations from Suffolk County, Massachusetts in 1774 and from Mecklenburg County, North Carolina in 1775. On April 12th of 1776, the North Carolina Provincial Congress promulgated the Halifax Resolves supporting in advance any move Congress might make towards separation from Great Britain. One month later, Virginia echoed the same views in even more strident tones. A lot of heat had been applied to the kettle of rebellion before it boiled over in July of 1776. John Penn, a native of Caroline County, North Carolina, figured prominently in the Halifax Resolves. Sooner than his colleagues, Hooper and Hughes, he had grasped the banner of revolution. Although trained for the law by cautious conservative Edmund Pendleton of Virginia, John Penn showed scant hesitation about advocating independence. This signer had a slow start in life. Barely literate at the age of 18, he applied himself diligently to study, principally in Pendleton's extensive library. He progressed rapidly enough to begin reading law under the same mentor. His desire for advancement in the legal profession induced him to move in 1774 to North Carolina, where the competition was less formidable. John Penn, a member of the North Carolina Provincial Congress of 1775, went to Congress in the same year and from then until 1780, shuttled back and forth between state 
and national legislatures. John Penn's biographies, like his political career, are short. He had one shining moment of glory in Philadelphia, then retired to be a country lawyer in an obscure North Carolina town where he died at the age of 48. Apart from signing the declaration, he is remembered for having adroitly reasoned his way out of shooting a man in a duel. John Penn was born outside Fredericksburg, Virginia to a farmer and the daughter of a county judge. The family appears to have been well off, but John Penn's father didn't think much of book learning, so he provided his son with only two or three years of education. Realizing he could barely scribble his own name, 18-year-old John Penn befriended, befriended a lawyer cousin seeking help. John Penn was seriously deficient compared to most wealthy men his age. Nearly all the high-born signers had graduated college by his age. John Penn had a lot of catching up to do. In the span of only three years, he borrowed books from his cousin's library, taught himself to read and write, began working in the man's law practice, and was admitted to the bar by age 21. He married Susanna Lime and practiced law in Virginia for about a decade before they moved over the North Carolina border to Granville County, northeast of Durham. A quick study, John Penn always seemed to impress people and thus landed greater responsibilities. He had only been living in North Carolina for two years when he signed the Declaration of Independence on behalf of his new home. John Penn does not appear to have had doubts about independence, as did his fellow North Carolinans, William Hooper and Joseph Hughes. And again, like always, I'm going to be reading from different sources. John Penn, a lawyer, patriot, received only a meager elementary education at a local school in Caroline County, Virginia. John Penn was 18 years old when his father died in 1759, leaving him a comfortable fortune. His uncle, Edmund Pendleton, who was licensed to practice law at age 20, allowed him the use of his excellent library. So see, this says it was his uncle, Edmund Pendleton. Pendleton. Obviously, I just read a few minutes ago, Source said it was a cousin. So again... You know, conflicting. I think it was his uncle, but just conflicting. There, John Penn studied law books and at 21 was licensed to practice law. He practiced successfully in Virginia for about 12 years. Many of Penn's relatives had moved to Granville County, North Carolina. And in 1774, he moved his family to the area of Williamsboro in Granville County. He quickly became a community leader and in 1775 was sent to the Provincial Congress where he served on important committees and won a reputation for tireless attention to his duties. He was a persuasive orator and won agreement among the local voters. A little bit about his genealogy. John Penn was born on May 27th of 1741 at Port Royal, Caroline County, Virginia. The only child of Moses and Catherine Taylor Penn. John Penn married on July 28th of 1763, Susanna Lynn. See, this one says Susanna Lynn. Other one said Susanna Lime. Daughter of Henry Lynn of Caroline County, Virginia and Granville County, North Carolina. The two of them had two surviving children, William the Eldest and Lucy, who married the Honorable John Taylor, son of James and Anna Pollard Taylor of uh, Orange County, Virginia. John Penn's will, in his own handwriting, made on March 1st of 1784, in abstracts of Granville County wills, names his two children, but does not mention his wife, Susanna apparently deceased. 
In the state census of North Carolina in 1786, John Penn's household in Island Creek District shows white males 21 to 60, three under 21, none, no females, blacks 20 to 50, 39, under 12 and over 50, 31. John Penn died September 24th of 1788 and buried and was buried at his own home place a few miles northeast of Stovall in Granville County, North Carolina. On April 25th of 1894, his remains were reinterred under the Signers Monument, then under construction in State Park Gulford Courthouse in Gulford County, Greensboro, North Carolina. The monument was dedicated on July 3rd of 1897. His children were William, Lucy, and an unnamed child who died. Susanna Lynn, or Lyme, I think it's Lynn Penn, his wife, was the daughter of Henry Lynn and was probably born in Caroline County, Virginia, as her father was still living there in 1747. Henry Lynn was probably born about 1720 in King and Queen County, Virginia. Possibly he was a grandson or great-grandson of William Lane, I don't know if it's Lynn or Lyne, L-Y-N-E, who sailed from Liverpool, England, and came to Virginia prior to 1635 with three sisters. Lucy, who married John Taylor of Caroline County, Virginia, and who married Mr. Shackelford of Dragon Swamp, King and Queen County, and Susanna, who married a Mr. Starling. Henry Lynn's household in the Nutbush District census of North Carolina was uh, white males 21 to 60, none, above 61, white females 3, blacks 47. His will was dated October 1797 and proved in May, court 1798, Granville County, North Carolina. He left his grandson, William Penn, a mulatto boy and $1,800. Further, he states, the land whereon I formerly lived in King and Queen County, Virginia, also to my grandson, Edmund Lynn, 521 and a half acres, whereon my water, grist mill, is in King and Queen County, Virginia, in my still, which is now in possession of his father. The Lynn family in England dates back to the Norman Conquest. They came from Lily in Flanders and were linen makers. Their coat of arms was bestowed during the reign of Bloody Queen Mary. Oliver Cromwell's mother was a Lynn. These Lynns, again, I don't know if it's Lynns or Lines, all emanated from Oxford, England, from nearby Swall Cliff. Henry Lynn was probably a brother of William Lynn II. George and John Lynn were all of King and Queen County, Virginia, and all were officers in the Revolutionary War. Ship records show they were in the West Indies before coming to Virginia by 1655, during the reign of Charles II. Richard Lee, Secretary of King's Council, mentioned his friend Mr. Lynn. Um, just kind of goes on to say a little bit more here. I'm just looking. So there's a lot more on the lineage um, uh, here. I'm not going to read all of it because it's a lot. It goes really deep into his genealogy and lineage. Um, so I think I'll skip over most of that, but maybe I'll even send it for like, save it for like part two sometime uh, tomorrow. But interestingly enough, we can already learn from what we just read. Uh, John Penn was a slave owner, and we will get to that more in detail, of course, in part two. Many of the signers of the Declaration of Independence have been victims of neglect and distortion. Their contributions either ignored or buried under the garble of political bias. Such has been the case of John Penn, a nephew of Edmund Pendleton, under whose tutelage he became one of those men who risked hanging to sign his name to a document which became the future hope of a nation and democracy. The success of such men has crept into the shadow of time 
but their courage and personal sacrifices remain an eternal beacon of hope for mankind everywhere. For many people, the name John Penn falls on deaf ears. They do not know who he was or what he accomplished. Some even confuse him with another John Penn, the grandson of William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania. Lest people lose sight of North Carolina's John Penn, it is necessary to keep in mind several of his accomplishments. He served in the Continental Congress for six years. He signed the Declaration of Independence. He signed the Articles of Confederation. He signed the Halifax Resolves, the North Carolina Constitution. And he was the virtual dictator of North Carolina at what arguably was the turning point of the American Revolution in 1781 to 1782. John Penn was born on May 17th of 1741 at Port Royal, Caroline County, Virginia, the only child of Moses Penn and Catherine Taylor Penn. And again, there you go with the dates, all contradicting. Everything is contradicting. This is May 17th, 1741. I think I just read a few minutes ago, May 27th. Uh, there's another source that I'll use here in a little bit that I believe says May 6th of 1740. I mean, all over the place. So, again, take it into context. I'll try to dive even deeper and get a pretty specific date. John Penn's grandfather, who was also named John Penn, was born about 1690 and died in 1741 but it is not known when the Penn family came to America. John Penn's great-grandfather on his mother's side, James Taylor, was born in his ancestral home, Pennington Castle, about 20 miles from Carlisle in England. He was a descendant of Baron Talifer, who fought at the Battle of Hastings in 1066 and became the Earl of Pennington. James Taylor arrived in Virginia in 1635 at the age of 20 and established the estate of Hare Forest on the Chesapeake Bay between the James and North Rivers. He married Francis Walker and two of their descendants became presidents of the United States, James Madison and Zachary Taylor. Another of John Penn's great grandfathers on his mother's side Philip Pendleton was born in 1650 and came to Virginia from Norwich, England in 1674. Philip's ancestors included George Pendleton Sr., Esquire of County Lancashire in England, town of Pendleton, who was born about 1500. The Pendleton family name was well known in public life during the reign of Henry VIII. I'm Henry the Eighth. I am Henry the Eighth. I am. I am. Sorry, it just anytime I hear Henry the Eighth, I always think of, of course, the Herman's Hermit's song, uh, Henry the Eighth. I am. So I apologize. John Penn grew up on a small farm in Caroline County, Virginia, where he had hills to climb, caves and dense woods to explore, a stream full of fish, and plenty of wildlife to hunt. He attended a common school for only two years. Moses Penn, his father, modestly wealthy, did not consider education to be important. But one important ingredient was lacking in his son's life, motivation. At the age of 18, John Penn's world changed dramatically. His father died, suddenly and unexpectedly leaving behind a grieving widow. The farm needed direction and his mother's support and care. The young man suddenly realized the need for an education and his uncle Edmund Pendleton took him under his wing. Pendleton was an accomplished attorney described by his friend Thomas Jefferson as the greatest orator in the colonies. Pendleton moved people by both knowledge and empathy and wrote George Washington's will the night before Washington was appointed 
commander-in-chief by the Continental Congress. It's pretty cool that his uncle, uh, Edmund Pendleton, wrote George Washington's will. That's pretty cool. John Penn practically moved into Pendleton's library, a library which both Jefferson and Adams described as having no equal in the colonies, one filled with history, biography, religion, and philosophy. Under Pendleton's auspices, Penn had the opportunity to observe some of Virginia's finest lawyers, learning both the fine points of the law and techniques. Just three years after the death of his father, in 1762, John Penn was licensed to practice law in Virginia and did so for the next 12 years. On July 28th of 1763, John Penn married Susanna Lynn, and they raised two children. And it is Lynn. It's not Lyne. It's L-Y-N-E. So I don't know if it's Lyne or Lynn. I'm going to pronounce it Lynn. Susanna's father, Henry Lynn, was born in Virginia about 1720. He was probably the grandson or great-grandson of William Lynn, who sailed from Liverpool to America around 1635. The Lynn family in England dates to the Norman Conquest. While he was practicing in Virginia, many of John Penn's relatives moved to Granville County, North Carolina. And in 1774, he moved his family to the area of Williamsboro, North Carolina. There appear to have been two reasons closely related for his removal at this time. One of the reasons was discovered by a retired Smithsonian historian who for years served as a liaison between the Smithsonian and the White House. In early 1774, John Penn found himself brought into court on charges of disrespectful and perhaps treasonous remarks about King George. Taxes and duties without representation were the issues and John Penn was in the vanguard of those colonials wanting immediate redress of the wrong or to break away from the mother country. It seems that John Penn had been intemperate in remarks about the king in a public meeting. Someone present reported him to royal authorities and Penn was duly charged. Although tried before friendly townsmen, John Penn was found guilty by the perhaps intimidated jury. The judge, perhaps less fearful, limited John Penn's punishment to a one penny fine. A man of principle, John Penn refused to pay the fine, thus sticking his neck out even further. The other reason for moving, which may have been the key, lay in John Penn's feelings about growing British rule and restrictions. Many other Virginians, including Judge Pendleton, who was chairman of the Virginia Committee of Public Safety, were also concerned about England misrule or English misrule. The difference was that Penn was on a faster track for independence, a complete separation, than was his uncle. Judge Pendleton still hoped England could be convinced to provide the colonists the same rights as those who enjoyed by residents in Great Britain. John Penn hesitated to go publicly against his benefactor, but at the same time, he was unwilling to subdue his growing radical inclinations. Granville County was the ideal place for a man whose thoughts were now filled with more advanced op opinions on liberty. Undoubtedly, he had heard from some relatives about the people who chafed under British heavy-handedness and the rule of commercial interests in the eastern part of North Carolina. They resented leadership, which treated them as ignorant upstarts, denying them their share of positions in local government. When John Penn arrived in the rural area of Williamsboro, he found two overriding concerns. The growing restrictions of British rule and the unfair treatment from a local government dominated by big plantation owners and wealthy merchants. John Penn was quickly accepted and recognized as a leader in Granville and his law practice took root. His popularity soared and in a few months 
He was elected to the First Continental Congress and to the Provincial Congress, much to the alarm of the Eastern North Carolina establishment, who viewed him as an intruder and a threat. All right, now I'm going to use that source that I've used uh, that I always preface by saying uh, it's an older source, uh, I believe from the 1800s sometime. So I'm going to use that now. Um, John Penn was a native of the County of Caroline in the province of Virginia, where he was born on the 17th day of May, 1741. He was the only child of his parents, Moses and Catherine Penn. The early education of young Penn was greatly neglected by his parents, who appear in no degree to have appreciated the value of knowledge. Hence, on his reaching the age of 18, he had only enjoyed the advantages conferred by a common school, and these for the space of but two or three years. The death of Mr. Penn occurred in the year 1759, on which event his son became his own guardian, and the sole manager of the fortune left him, which, though not large, was comp competent. It was fortunate that his principles at this early age were in a good degree established. Otherwise, he might, at this unguarded period of his life, left as he was without paternal counsel and direction, have become the dupe of the unprincipled or given loose to passions having ruined himself by folly and dissipation. Although the cultivation of his mind had been neglected in the manner we have stated, he possessed intellectual powers of no ordinary strength, and, as he now enjoyed a competent fortune, and possessed a disposition to cultivate those powers, it is not surprising that his progress should have been rapid. Fortunately, he lived in the vicinity of Edmund Pendleton, a gentleman of rare endowments, highly distinguished for his legal attainments, and well known as one of the most accomplished statesmen of Virginia. Mr. Pendleton, being a relative, young Penn sought access to his library, which was one of the best in the province. The privilege, which was thus freely and liberally liberally granted him was by no means neglected by means of reading the powers of his mind soon began to unfold themselves and he at length determined to devote himself to the study of law such a project on the part of a young man whose early education had been so greatly neglected and whose only guide through the labyrinth that lay before him was to be his own good sense was indicative of powers of no ordinary character. Our country has furnished examples of a similar kind, and to the obscure and neglected, they present the most powerful motives to exertion and per perseverance. The author of our being has prescribed no narrow limits to human genius, nor conferred upon any one class of persons that exclusive privilege of becoming intellectually great. At the age of 21, Mr. Penn reaped in part the reward of his toil and indefatigable industry in being licensed as a practitioner of law. The habits of study and application which he had now formed were of great advantage to him in pursuing the business of his profession. He rose with great, uh, great rapidness into notice and soon equaled the most distinguished at the bar. As an advocate in particular, there were few who surpassed him. In 1774, Mr. Penn moved to the province of North Carolina, where he soon occupied a distinguished, as distinguished a place at the bar as he had done in Virginia. Although by his own removal to another province, it was necessary to understand and apply a new code of laws. With these, he had made himself acquainted with ease and celerity. Uh, another source here. John Penn was born on May 17th of 1741 in the vicinity of Port Royal, Virginia. His parents were Moses and Catherine Taylor Penn. 
John's mother was the sister of Lieutenant Colonel Richard Taylor, the latter being the father of President Zachary Taylor. John was educated in a local school, but did not receive the advantage of being sent to England to further his education. However, his natural propensity for absorbing knowledge permitted him to take advantage of his cousin Edmund Pendleton's library, which was expansive and included much information on the subject of law. See, this one says cousin, but others say uncle. Uh, interesting. Through self-education, John was able to begin practicing law in Virginia during the early 1760s. In the meantime, his father had died during 1759, leaving him a moderate estate. In 1774, John and his wife, Suzanne Lime Penn, again, not correct, whom he married during 1763, established residence in North Carolina in the vicinity of Stovall. John set up a law practice and his reputation began to rise in the eyes of the people in Granville County. The following year, John Penn was elected to the North Carolina Provincial Congress and was chosen as a delegate to the Continental Congress to succeed Richard Caswell, who became the state's governor. Of course, some more sources here. Patriot, Continental Congress member, and North Carolina signer of the Declaration of Independence, John Penn was a native of Caroline County, Virginia. Although he achieved only a limited formal education, Penn read many books from the library of Edmund Pendleton, a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses, and Penn's uncle. Under the tutelage of Pendleton, Penn served as a legal apprentice and in 1762 obtained a license to practice law. The Patriot first practiced law in Virginia before traveling to Granville County, North Carolina, and establishing a law practice. Penn's involvement in public affairs began with his 1775 election to the Continental Congress. He was re-elected in 1777, 78, and 79, and served on various committees, which we'll get into in more depth tomorrow in part two, of course. Uh, let's see, one more source. You see, this is the one that says uh, May 6th of 1740 that he was born, which is crazy because that's like the only source that I find that says that. Um, it's interesting. Uh, John Penn, a revolutionary statesman and signer of the Declaration of Independence, was born near Port Royal in Caroline County, Virginia, the only son of Moses and Catherine Taylor Penn. Moses Penn did not place a high priority on formal education, so his son received only a few years of instruction at a local school. When John was 18, his father died, leaving him a comfortable estate. Thereafter, Edmund Pendleton, young Penn's kinsman and neighbor, offered him the use of his library. Penn studied law under Pendleton's guidance and at age 21 was admitted to the bar in Caroline County where he practiced law for the next 12 years. John Penn married Susanna Lyme, or Lynn, or Lyme, this one says Lyme, of Granville County, North Carolina on July 28th of 1763. No doubt family ties influenced the Penns' move to North Carolina in 1774. John Penn purchased a farm in the northern part of Granville County near present-day Stovall. The following year, he was elected to the 3rd Provincial Congress, which met at Hillsborough on August 20th of 1775. An active member of the Congress, John Penn was elected to succeed Richard Caswell as a delegate to the Continental Congress. Caswell had resigned to become the treasurer for the Southern District of North Carolina. So that's almost pretty much it. Again, Penn was born near Port Royal in Caroline County. This source says May 17, 1741. Uh, the only son of Moses Penn and Catherine Taylor Penn. Um, 
On July 28, 1763, Penn married Susanna Lynn, or Lyne. The couple had three children. Their daughter, Lucy, married John Taylor of Caroline, a political leader from Virginia. Um, 1774, Penn moved to Stovall, North Carolina. There he was a representative at the colony's third provincial congress in August of 1775. Um... I want to check something here. Let me see something here. All right. So see, you know what I was doing? Who's better than me? I mean, don't give me, don't answer that. A lot of people. Um, but I was actually looking at my photos from my visit to John Penn's original gravesite, And then, of course, he was reinterred at that Signers Monument, which doesn't really tell me much about his actual birth date. But on his original gravesite, on the tombstone at his original grave it says may 6th of 1740 so believe it or not that source that i just read from a few minutes ago that said may 6th of 1740 they're right that is his actual birth date uh you know and it, it's crazy to me because what are you gonna tr here's what, what you do what do you trust right do you trust the people that wrote articles or do you trust the guy's own gravesite? I'm going to kind of trust his own gravesite. Maybe that's foolish of me, but that's kind of where I go with it. Um yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at with things that according to his own gravesite, it's May 6th of 1740. That is what it says, May 6th of 1740. Now, I will try to do even more research, but I'm going to go with that, that his actual birth date was May 6th of 1740. Um, I think that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, even on the National Park Service website, it says Penn was born in 1740 or 1741. So there you go. Even the National Park Service, who, by the way, I'm pretty sure does run the um, that Gulliford National Military Park there in, uh, in, in North Carolina. I believe that's Greensboro. Even they who run that say 1740 or 1741. So I don't know. I'm still going to go by the man's original grave site. Maybe that's foolish of me. Um, it, you know, and, and that gravestone, so everyone knows, was erected by the John Penn chapter of the National Society of the Daughters of the uh, American Revolution. Um, so, I don't know. I think they kind of probably have a bit better research and know, but who knows. So there you go, guys. That is kind of the early life um, of John Penn. But definitely born in Virginia. We know that. Uh, definitely uneducated pretty much his whole youth and his whole childhood. A self-taught man. Uh, became a lawyer and then moved down to North Carolina. We know all this to be very factual. So, hope you enjoyed this part one. Uh, there is no bonus footage for part one. Part two, we definitely will have bonus footage. But part one, there is nothing for me to offer you. Uh, as a matter of fact, when it comes to John Penn, there's nothing, even in the state of Virginia, that says, um, you know, like, there's not even, like, a roadside sign that says anything about his birthplace was nearby, or, you know, John Penn was born here. There's nothing. Um, there is a Caroline County, I believe, sign uh, from Caroline County, Virginia. Um, but it doesn't say anything. It just says, formed in 1727 from Essex King and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't talk anything about John Penn being born there or near there or being born in that county. Uh, there's nothing. So, uh, yeah. So, unfortunately, there's no, like, fun little thing to show you, um, regarding his birthplace uh, from Virginia. So that's why I'm not going to be doing any bonus footage uh, as far as this part one goes. 
So there you go. Uh, the early life, uh, legacy, and just kind of the the overall early uh, part of John Penn's life, which is very interesting. Um, hold on here. I'm looking at something. Let me see something. See, I, I keep contradicting myself. Yeah, no, there's nothing. I was just looking at some uh, resources regarding historical markers for John Penn. And there is a couple, but they're down in North Carolina. So again, nothing in Virginia. So there you go, guys. Sorry, uh, kind of rambling on here, but just want to be accurate for you guys, as accurate as possible. Um, thanks so much, guys, for everything. The likes, the subscribes, comments, questions. Love it all. Hope you enjoyed part one. John Penn, our last North Carolina signer. And stay tuned tomorrow for part two of our basically closing it out here of John Penn, our last North Carolina signer. Uh, stay tuned for part two tomorrow. Thanks so much, guys. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye now.